One of my nephews is in need of a new gaming PC, so on the table next to me are the parts that I picked out for him. This is going to be a 1080p high performance, but as low buck as possible build. So we spent a total of $418 on all of the parts here, plus a case, which is too big to fit next to me. Come along for the ride. Today's video is brought to you by Antlion Audio and their full lineup of audio gear and accessories. Gaming headsets are a combination of two items, headphones and microphones, but they often forget one important thing. Make the microphone good. Just because you don't have to listen to your own crappy microphone doesn't mean your teammates should suffer. With Antlion, you can skip the expensive RGB and overprocessed audio. The ModMic Wireless allows you to equip a broadcast quality mic onto any set of headphones, like my Audio-Technica M50Xs. And since the mic transmits over aptX, it has latency that's five times faster than Bluetooth. For those that prefer in-ear monitors to studio cans, the all-new Kimura IEMs are a combo rivaled only by putting stouts into bourbon barrels. Available in either single or dual driver models, the handcrafted resin in-ear monitors deliver audiophile-approved sound to your ears, while the flexible microphone captures broadcast quality recordings. Don't believe me? This entire ad was recorded on the Kimura. Check out the full lineup of gear from Antlion Audio by following the links down in the video description. And again, a huge thanks to Antlion Audio for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. Like I said, the goal for this build is to be as low buck as possible, but not leave too many things on the table. We want the system to look good and perform well, but still potentially leave some upgrade options in the future. And so these are the parts that we came up with. Now I know what most of you will be expecting out of a build like this, considering I have multiple trays worth of X79 and X99 compatible Xeons to choose from. The problem is, start to consider power to performance levels and where the modern CPUs are starting to land. Most of these CPUs are 115 or even 135 watt TDP chips. That's a lot of power to sink into a gaming system. Instead, we're going to go with a more modern platform in the AMD B450 chipset and go with a much more modern CPU in a Ryzen 3 3300X. This is a 7 nanometer Zen 2 based CPU with only a 65 watt TDP. Best of all, even at that lower wattage, it straight up beats any Xeon on this table by a solid 50%. Don't believe me? I've benchmarked literally every single one of these CPUs, and the best single-threaded Cinebench R15 score I've ever gotten out of one is 142. This one got a 199 with no tweaks whatsoever. Is this going to lose in multi-threaded performance? Sure, but this is a 1080p gaming system. We're not exactly going to be rendering video, and we're not necessarily concerned with multi-threaded performance right now. To give the CPU all of the memory bandwidth they could ever handle, we're going with a 16 gigabyte kit of Patriot Viper 3600 DDR4. This should be a fantastic match for our quad core CPU. Now, while I did score the CPU used on AliExpress for only 50 bucks, we're going brand new with the memory, the motherboard, and the storage. The memory you can pick up on Amazon right now for $38, and if you wanted to save an extra seven or eight bucks, you can get a 3200 MTS set for about $30 brand new right now. The motherboard might be a little bit of a controversial choice, but I wanted a brand new motherboard, not a used one, and every single dollar counts on this system. So for just $62 on AliExpress, I picked up an Odina B450S Micro ATX motherboard. It's got pretty much every amenity that I need in a build like this. A PCI Express X16 slot, NVMe Gen 4 compatibility if we really wanted to stress this thing out, although we're going with a Gen 3 drive, as well as a pair of DDR4 DIMM slots. Keeping our 65 watt CPU nice and cool is probably the most extravagant choice on this system, but it does give it a little bit of RGB flair, and that's in the Thermalrite AXP120 67 millimeter cooler. This is a top-down cooler, which will help keep the motherboard and VRM cool as well, and the CPU cooler was only $31. Again, if you wanted to save a good amount of money, you could probably pick up an AMD stock cooler for just $10 and save yourself the extra cash. For storage, we're going with the tried and true Silicon Power A60 1TB Gen 3x4 NVMe drive. With 1TB of space, you get plenty of storage for all of the modern titles that take upwards of 120 to 150 gigabytes per installation. 
Seriously, guys, start going with some compression in your game installs. And secondly, at just about $35 to $40 on Amazon, you get all of that storage at a fairly reasonable price. For graphics cards, there's not a lot of options to fit inside of a $400-ish dollar budget, unless you go with a brand new RX 6400, or you can go with a refurbished, remanufactured RX 580. However, there is another option popping up on AliExpress lately for under $130, and that is the RX 5700 XT. This is far and above a better option than the RX 580 based on Polaris, and best of all, this card was just $108. $108 for an RX 5700 XT with 8 gigabytes of VRAM. That's a win in my book. Now I will say I am cheating ever so slightly when it comes to keeping this system in budget, especially when it comes to the power supply. You see, I picked up this Corsair CX430M power supply from a local electronics recycler for about $5. Now, power supplies like this come up all the time at my local facility for about that same price point but the price savings on the power supply allowed me to spring for the AXP120 and give this build a little bit extra flair inside of it. You could just as easily pick up a 400 or 500 watt power supply on Amazon for between 30 and $40 and go with an AMD stock cooler, like I mentioned earlier. Since this is a gaming PC, I didn't want to skimp at all when it came to RGB and aesthetics. So I picked up a full set of Antec 120mm RGB fans for just $31 on Amazon. So that is all of the gear that we're going to use, but what case do we put all of this in and keep it looking good? That comes down to a Blue Gears B Pelucide, I think is how you pronounce that, micro ATX case with tempered glass front panels and side panels, and I was able to pick this up on Amazon for just $56. Those are the parts, that's the build, and now you know the objective. Let's go ahead and get this thing together. And welcome back. The build is all together, it is fully benchmarked, and I definitely have some thoughts both on the performance of the system and on the parts that I selected for this. And I think we'll start there. The difference between the content that I produce on my channel versus other tech channels, and this is not calling anyone out specifically, it's just a difference in philosophy. I like to experiment with different components. Obviously, I most famous for a lot of my Chinese X79 and X99 builds, but I like to see if something can work. It, not necessarily presenting my videos as a 100% follow this guide, I'm more trying to get my audience to think critically about if different combinations of components can still get a good result. And sometimes you win those, and sometimes you lose those. And this is one situation where 
I can't fully stand behind all of the parts that I put into this system. Let me explain. Let's start with the part that I really should have seen coming, and that is the power supply. I used a Corsair 430 watt power supply in here, but during testing, the system drew in excess of 380 watts measured from the wall. And in my opinion, that's just flying a little bit too close to the sun. So I think before I deliver the system, I am gonna swap that out for probably at least a 500 watt power supply, just to make sure it doesn't randomly explode on him. Secondly, let's talk about the motherboard, in this case, the Odna B450S. Now, obviously, this selection was made because it was the cheapest brand new B450 board that I could find on either Amazon or AliExpress, and it cost me just $62. Now, I've worked with Chinese motherboards in the past and had some pretty good success with them. So long as you keep their limitations and feature sets in mind, you should be able to work around almost anything that comes your way, except with this one. Let's start off with what it got right. The Odna B450S is an AM4 socket motherboard and it does accept CPUs from either the Zen 1, Zen Plus, Zen 2, or Zen 3 families and they all seem to work out of the box with no issues. Obviously, you need to keep your CPU expectations tempered. What I mean by that is I don't think this motherboard is going to survive putting in something like a 5950X 16 core CPU, which draws almost 200 watts through the socket. The VRM just isn't going to handle that well. But using a CPU like I did here in the 3300X or even stepping up to a 3300G or even a 5700G, I think this motherboard would handle that just fine through the VRM. The board also has rebar support enabled from the factory, as well as PCI Express 4.0, so your X16 lane is going to get the full bandwidth if you wanted to step up your video card selection from something more than a 5700 XT. But now, let's talk about the issues, and there's a lot of them. Now, one of the standard complaints of a lot of these Chinese market motherboards is the fan headers in use here. Typically, there's only one, maybe two regulated fan headers. What I mean by that is controllable in the BIOS that can ramp up and down with CPU temperature loads. This one only has a single regulated fan header. It's a PWM plug, which is awesome, but I had to use a five-way splitter with another two-way jack coming out of that to power all six fans in here to keep the RGB fans from running at just 100% all the time off that second header. That means I have all six fans in this system plugged into the single CPU fan header. And this isn't an ancillary powered fan splitter either. They're all being powered off that CPU header. So far, it's worked just fine, but I don't think I would trust that as a long-term solution. And in fact, I'm probably going to get a powered fan hub before I pass this system along. Next up, let's talk memory support, or rather the complete lack thereof when it comes to this motherboard. You see, DDR4 memory in its official spec is designed to run at 2133 megahertz. Anything above that is considered an overclock. Now, most motherboards for the last 15 years have come with an auto overclock feature for your memory. Intel calls it XMP, AMD has a couple of different names for it, but the long and short of it is that your memory is able to overclock to your memory's rated speed. With DDR4, it could be anything from 2666 to even 4000 or 4400 megahertz. With a Zen 2 CPU like the 3300X, the recommended speed to run your memory is 3600 megahertz, which is the kit that I bought and have installed here. Unfortunately, this motherboard has absolutely no automatic memory overclocking support. Now it will allow you to manually tune your memory, but that means manually defining every single last varying spec that your memory needs to know to run at a certain speed. Unfortunately, memory overclocking is not as simple as just setting it to 3600 megahertz and defining your voltage and calling it a day. You have to actually go in and define every last bit of latency, stepping and timing inside of the memory chips themselves. And that is an exhaustive list. And often these aren't just laid out for you on data sheets. They're pre-programmed into the XMP profiles of the memory itself. There's not an easy way to extract those except by plugging in that memory kit to another motherboard, recording all of the values that that motherboard set it to, and then defining those protocols and values on this motherboard. I didn't go through all of those steps because I didn't feel like troubleshooting when it didn't work. So 
the memory in the system is running at 2133 megahertz, and likely that's where I'm going to leave it. If this was going to be my PC, I think I'd be a little bit more apt to define those memory protocols myself, go through all of the list of timing and steppings and everything else, but I'm giving this system to a kid who just wants to game at 1080p, and honestly, while there would be a performance bump from getting 2666 or 3000 or even 3600 megahertz out of this memory, I don't think it's worth risking instability giving it to a kid who has no idea how to actually manually overclock memory. If you're seeking a project, this is definitely one you could tackle, but it's not one I'm going to tackle. Lastly, talking about the motherboard, there's some features that this motherboard is just missing when it comes to what a lot of people would expect out of a modern motherboard, especially one costing only 10 or $15 less than mainstream board offerings. Uh, in this case, one thing I really miss this board not having is RGB. You see, love it or hate it, RGB has become a mainstay and staple feature of modern motherboards. And most motherboards do include headers for either RGB 12 volt, which is the single color, or addressable RGB in a five volt variant. This motherboard has neither. And because I bought this fan kit, expecting to be able to just daisy chain these fans together and be able to control the lights and software, I had to spend an additional $10 on an RGB controller to make the lighting work inside of the system. Do you know where I would rather have spent $10 on this system? That's right, in a motherboard that would support actual XMP overclocking, have more than a single fan header for controlling the six fans in the system, and had RGB headers on it. Just spending an extra 10 or $15 on this board would have alleviated all of the problems that I've had with this system. So sometimes you buy cheap because it's a fantastic value. And other times you can definitely get burned because of the features that cheaper part doesn't have. Overall, I think I am very happy with the way the system turned out. The cooler keeps the CPU at a fairly reasonable 62 degrees when gaming, a uh, little bit higher than that when you're trying to really push it with something like Cinebench or AVX workloads, but I don't think the system is going to be used that way. So for a $30 cooler, I think it's a fantastic option. This case looks incredible, especially with the panoramic tempered glass front and side panels here. It has some drawbacks though. It's a very thin material. It's not something that's overly sturdy, so I wouldn't buy this and call it a, a LAN gaming rig. This is not something you should be transporting a rig in, but it does hold everything fairly nicely. It has absolutely jack all when it comes to cable management though. The RGB fan headers and everything is just kind of bundled and zip tied in here. There's no actual cable traces or tie off points to manage your cables. So the back of this looks like a rat's nest despite my best efforts. For $55, I think it's a fantastic looking case, but you're never gonna get a showcase quality PC unless you do custom cabling, but you're not gonna do custom cabling inside of a $55 case either. I think it's fine. So with the build and aesthetics out of the way, let's go ahead and talk performance. And there's definitely some things to talk about. This PC is aimed at 1080, 60, maybe even 1080, 90 FPS gaming. And I think for a $420 PC, we absolutely knocked it out of the park. Let's go ahead and start our benchmarks off with Fallout 4. Now Fallout 4 is a V-Sync title. It is locked at a maximum of 60 frames per second. So your average should be 60 frames per second. And that's exactly what we got here with an average of 59.8. That was at ultra settings with FXAA anti-aliasing enabled. We also got a 1% low of 41.6 and a 0.1% low of 23.1. Now that might be a little bit of a large variance and I'm not necessarily happy with the 0.1% low, but overall, this is still a fantastically playable game, especially at ultra settings. But Fallout 4 is far from the most demanding title on the market today. For that, we're gonna have to jump up our game a little bit. So let's jump into Red Dead Redemption 2. With those settings, we wound up with an average of 98.8 frames per second, a 1% low of 70.2, and a 0.1% low of 63.3, which means even in the worst case scenarios, we still stayed above 60 frames per second. Not too shabby for a system that costs less than an Xbox Series X. Keep in mind, while we were using the RTX edition of Red Dead Redemption 2, we did not have any DLSS or FSR enabled in this title, so that was pure rasterization at its finest. 
Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, we ran at high settings at 1080p and got an average of 125.5 frames per second with a 1% low of 49.9. Now those that know the games that run in the Borderlands engine, like Borderlands 3 and Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, know that when you're switching from hip fire to scope fire, there can be a little bit of latency during that process. And we certainly still see that here with a 0.1% low of 13.2. But as I mentioned with pretty much every review of this game, it never really impacts packs game performance unless your 1% low also drops down with it. In this case, our 1% low stayed at 50 frames per second, which in my book is just fine. There was a time not that long ago that Wreckfest was one of the most demanding games out there, but I think modern graphics cards have since put that theory to bed. At ultra settings and 1080p, we see an average of 155.9 frames per second with a 1% low of 94 and a 0.1% low of 85. Wow. Just wow. And finally, we come to Crisis 4, I mean Starfield, which is pretty much the most demanding game that has ever been made and released on the PC. Now, I'm not expecting the world of this game, and as long as the system's able to run it at all, I'm going to chalk that up as a win. For testing today, we ran at 1080p medium settings and left FSR 2.0 enabled just to show what is capable if you don't mind the occasional graphical anomaly. Now, Starfield, as diverse of a game as it is, you really can't just give it one set of benchmark numbers and call it a day. You really need to test multiple scenarios and give those scenarios their own benchmark results. And that's what I've done here. Now, obviously, one of the most demanding areas of the game is the new Atlantis spaceport, where we see an average of just 45.8 frames per second, a 1% low of 24, and a 0.1% low of 7. Now, luckily, no action of any consequence ever really happens in the new Atlantis spaceport. So as long as you can muster through with a 0.1% low of seven frames per second, the game is still perfectly playable. Blasting off into space and flying around some debris fields, we see an average of 68.5 frames per second, a 1% low of 54, and a 0.1% low of 43, which is a much more reasonable frame rate to play this game at. It's not exactly a twitch shooter. Most of the space combat relies on a lot of auto targeting and simply lining up your shot. So this frame rate is perfectly playable here. And finally, planet side in a typical explorable environment, we see an average of 83.3 frames per second, a 1% low of 47 and a 0.1% low of 35. There was a little bit of latency, especially during gun combat, that I would like to see bump up just a little bit higher. But again, we were running at medium settings and we could lower some of those settings and some of the eye candy and make this game a little bit better. But overall, I think for the budget that we put into the system, it is more than playable as is. And so this is my most recent attempt at a sub $500 gaming PC. And it's certainly much better performance than I've gotten in previous years, especially now that graphics cards and motherboards have come back down in price. Now there's still a number of tweaks that I need to do to the system before I send it off to my nephew. First off, I am going to replace the RAM kit because there's no sense in giving him a 3600 megahertz kit when the system can only run it at 2133. I'm also going to replace the power supply with something that won't burn up with the 380 watts of power this is requiring from the wall. But overall, I think I'm more than happy with the way the system turned out. As usual, if you're interested in any of the parts from today's build, I will have Amazon and AliExpress affiliate links down in the video description. Go give those a look. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Also, don't forget to head on over to craftcomputing.store, grab some of my merch, and start drinking like a pro. That's gonna do for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. I need some more coffee.